Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 11th episode of Taps and Patience. I am AJ with Design the Everything, and I am here with Harrison of Precision Ingenuity. Hey, man. How you doing? Doing good. Man, episode 11. Time flies. I'm pretty sure it's 11. Oh, I'm man. like 90% it's 11. Okay. That could be. I, I don't remember. I was I didn't think we were in the double digits yet, but I guess we are. So that's, that's yeah, cool. I believe the last one was 10. Unless oh, okay. this one is 10. But I think yeah. it's the last one that was 10. Gotcha. Well, that's awesome. So uh, how we doing? How was last week? Uh, pretty good. Pretty productive. Yeah. We, yep. we actually had a, a horrible week last week in a lot of Uh-oh. ways, but, but also kind of a good week. So it's kind well, of let's a, a start mixture. There. <laughs> okay, do you want the good or do you want the bad? Um, is, if there's multiple items, stack them. Like a good bad Oreo. Okay. Um, so there's not really a, a stack. It's I guess I can go good, bad, good. Um, so the the good news is is that um, I've got been able to pick up some more new contacts, and I have a company that I'm working with locally that wants some big equipment designed and manufactured. And I got to factory tour their facility last week. Um, nice. And until I, I work with them a little bit, I, I won't share the company name. Um, but right now it's an extremely manual process and they're looking into a lot of automation. So they're, they're a distribution center and they get a bunch of, a bunch of boxes in and then they have to open up those boxes boxes, pull out all the contents, sort them, and repackage them to ship out. And so they don't do any manufacturing there. All they do is they open up packages, pull out the contents, organize them into different groups, and then reship them out in smaller group packages. And so it's an extremely manual process. Um, and and they, they ship out a ton of stuff out of this facility. And so there's a lot of different instances where uh, they want to include some automation. They have a little bit, um, but they're just scratching the surface of what they can do with automation. And I'm hoping that I can kind of get in on the front end of that. So, so would this be like design build type projects? It would be. It would be. And it, it, some of it would be more than just like machining parts and designing parts. It's actually going to include some engineering. Um, and I think that'll be a lot of fun. It'll give me an opportunity. So I'm mechanical and electrical, and I haven't done much with my electrical oh, okay. side yet. So. I'm excited in the sense that I'll get to actually play around with maybe some programming um, for some of this stuff. Um, and there's some other local companies that do um, automation programming stuff that I can work with. Uh, so I'm not sure if I will outsource that or if I will, how much of that I will do myself. Um, but it sounds like it could be a ton of fun. And I'm really looking forward to see what it actually leads into because it could open other doors um, especially because I don't really have to buy any new equipment to do anything because I'm more comfortable with um, outsourcing different parts of this project. And it's just going to be using my engineering abilities and sourcing parts after I've designed everything. Um, And, you know, there'll probably be some machining on my end, but it'll probably be uh, mostly design and have other people fabricate because it'll be a lot of tubing stuff and welding. Yep. So and air cylinders. A lot of air cylinders and solenoids, stuff of that nature as well. So that's that's the good news. So All right, now we need the Oreo stuff in here. <laughs> okay. So bad news is, is that our fiber laser has gone down. Oh, no. Yeah. So they think it's a problem with the, the actual board inside of it. And thankfully, it's under warranty. But good news with bad news. Um our laser work is starting to pick up like crazy Uh huh. <laughs> and then it goes down. Yes. So we have about um, 50 tumblers that a company wanted engraved for their Christmas present. And we have, we, we ordered in the tumblers and the day that they came in the mail was the day our laser went down. Oh no. So, um, and then we also had that, that same company had, we had done, some work for um, in fact, it was the very last thing we engraved was some parts for them that we were prototyping that we put their logo on. And so now um, 
we had another prototype we were working on for them and we were going to put their logo on it and we couldn't because the laser had gone down. So yeah, um, they were still really happy with it, but I didn't get to like blow them away with their little logo on it. So yeah. Um, so we got to get that going. Um, and then let's see here. Some more good news. Um, once again, we're getting more and more connections at random places. So I've had several different people that have contacted us um, that are like friends of friends, kind of like, like they, they did some work for us or I did some work for them a while back. And then they tell someone else it's kind of word of mouth. And so one of them is something that I'm really hoping works out and it's really exciting if it does. Um, I can't say any details on it right now, but if it does, um, it could appear on some big TV broadcasts. That's all I'm going to say for now, but I, I really hope um, that that one works out because that would be massive if I could advertise that I was the one that made that. Um, so that one's exciting. What else was there? Um, some more kind of good news, bad news. Um, we're getting some more work, but the problem is we're running into an issue now where we have more work coming in than we have cash to actually buy all of the materials mm. that we need to do some of yeah. the work. And so it's kind of a catch 22 where we want to take on more work, but we don't have the cash flow to buy all the resources we need to take on some of these jobs. Um, and some of that has exasperated by the fact that we have a couple jobs that um, are behind in payment. And so um, that's really putting the screws down on a few areas. Um, but hopefully once we get the payments issues resolved, that'll kind of fix itself. Um, but we'll see. So are you, are you a no debt company generally, or do you guys take debt? We try to avoid it as much as possible, but I mean, our machine, our Tormach is financed. That's how we got that. Um, the Haas? Our, huh? Is the Haas? The Haas is the well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but every, that's, those are the only two things that ha are financed in any way. Um, everything else we try to, we try to pay cash for um, whenever we have it. So. Yeah. Uh, Financing. Financing material to be able to do a job, though, like that's that's good debt, I would say. Like, I, I wouldn't think twice about that. Yeah, it, it is. Um, we've just been putting it on business credit cards for now. And the only problem with that is that it's only deferred one month. And then yes. you start having additional payments on it. And if the job takes a month and then you have a net 30 payment term, that's going to come up before the job pays out. Um, do you have net 30 with your material suppliers? Because you can get net 30 with your material suppliers, pay by credit card and get another month. Yes. Yes. We, we have, we're in the process of getting, cause we've, we've have accounts with some of these people, but not all of them. We've got a few new suppliers and for their first few orders, we had to put it on the credit card um, because they didn't have the payment turn set up and we need to get the material yeah. in ASAP. So um but hopefully in the future, we will be on net 30. We need to do more stuff on net 30 instead of just the credit card. Um, Cause that would definitely help. So I, I'll, I have built design the everything on the PayPal financing. Like that is how, how most of design the everything has been funded. The exception being the mill back there, everything else, PayPal financing, cause they have six months interest free. As long as oh, you pay okay. it off in six, six months. And so like if I order from online metals, like, yeah, mm -hmm. that just goes on the, the PayPal financing. If I don't gotcha. have a chance to pay it off right away. Gotcha. Um, the laser, PayPal financing. My first pocket NC, PayPal financing. Hmm. I'll have to look into that a little bit more. So what about you? What's going on with you? Uh, I basically have kind of a bunch of smaller things that I got done this week. I mean, carabiner pro or carabiner production is just kind of rolling at this point. Mm -hmm. It it's in a solid rhythm. I know where all my bottlenecks are, uh, mm -hmm. which is the tumblers at this point. I can tumble eighty carabiners a day, and so that means I need to mill eighty carabiners a day, which is 
easy peasy. That's just four pallets. And I mm-hmm. was expecting to do like five or six pallets. And for a while there I was. So I have a little bit of a, I have some inventory in front of the, uh, in front of the tumblers. So the bottleneck is always being fed. And as long as I maintain that, everything's, you know, fairly sedate. That's so awesome. that's just been, that's just been rolling. Uh, the only, the only production issues I've hit since the major ones I had earlier is the Tormach seems to kind of move its work hoarding system just, just a little bit, just enough to bug me. And I, I think it's probably thermal effects because I, I always have to adjust my offsets like first thing in the morning and then like halfway through the day. Mm-hmm. But we're talking three thou on the centerness of that slot. Yeah, so it's not that a big sounds deal. about right, honestly, from my experience. So, so. I, I do, I, I check about every other palette and just kind of shift my offsets a little bit. And mm-hmm. generally, I go like one way, three thou, and then I'm, later in the day, I go back. So, yep. So, let me ask you a question As you're getting them done, are you planning on shipping them out as they come down, or are you going to wait and do it all at once? So, I would be shipping right now if I could. The okay. the holdup is I have changed my packaging, which was the other thing I was going to talk about. Oh, okay. I you you got me watching those Jenny and Davis videos, and they have <laughs> just very pristine, beautiful packaging, and it made me yes. feel bad about my packaging. <laughs> and I, I thought I was doing a good job, but I saw someone who was doing better, and was like, okay, I can do better. And so the other day I sat down, I actually recorded this and posted it as a YouTube video, but I sat down with my graphic designer buddy, Scott, and we talked through the packaging design and the opening experience and Mm -hmm. all of those details. Yeah. And he just sent me earlier today proofs for a packaging redesign. We're going to get custom printed boxes. I, I found out, and this was the thing that I did not understand and that Jenny and Davis taught me. So these boxes right here from Uline, if you're mm-hmm. not watching on the, the video podcast, it is just a white box. It is three inches by three inches by one inch tall. Mm-hmm. These run about 45 cents plus shipping from mm-hmm. Uline. I can get custom printed boxes with my logo and branding and like some Easter eggs and like just much prettier boxes, full color inside and outside printing for about 70, 75 cents. So, so it's a little bit more expensive, but like not game changingly expensive. And it looks so much more professional. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I don't know if you knew this, but we actually did custom packaging for our uh, desk lawn, or our, uh, not desk lawns, our uh, deck defenders. I I remember that now. Uh, who'd you, who'd you order it from? Uh, I can't remember the company, but I would probably never use them again if they're okay. first, if they're first batches. So we, we got a bunch that, had these random red lines on some of the packages that would show where the bend line was. Um, But they didn't all have it and it wasn't needed because there was creases already in the packages. So you didn't need them. So I I don't know what that was about. And it it was inconsistent as to where they were. And then some of them, the the printing was like off one way or off another way. Like it was just, I would say one in five or one in 10 had an issue um, and it was just like inconsistent. Like, did, did someone QC these? Did they look at them? Like, what was going on? Um, well, I should say, first rule of packaging is that it's wildly inconsistent. Plus or minus an eighth inch is like good in the printing and packing industry. Well, okay. I'll give you that. But the random red lines that show that up on the weird. Pack- yeah. Yeah. I'll have so, to, I'll, I'll have to see if I can find some at the shop and, and, bring them home that way i can show uh those uh, viewers that are seeing the video the difference between them i know what they did are you ready for this i know exactly hmm. what they did so when you un when you're designing packaging it's in an unfolded state mm-hmm. and just like a sheet metal part and mm-hmm. they use just like when you're setting up for a laser cutter they use different colored lines to mean different things on that mm-hmm. flat pattern so like mm-hmm. a, a red line might mean fold fold up, a blue line might mean fold down, a green mm-hmm. line is cut, whatever. The, the files that they use to make that packaging is called a die line. Mm-hmm. And it has both your artwork on it and then also those folding dimension stuff. Mm-hmm. If they, 
they have to remember to remove those fold marks that makes from sense. the printer. Like if you like you can accidentally print those fold marks if you aren't paying attention. And they probably had them arrayed out on, you know, some bigger sheet size. And on like one of the little one of the little it's not a pocket. Like, uh, like they missed a row or a column. Yeah, they just forgot to delete one of the lines, which is why only like one in ten had it, because they had, you know, ten arranged on a sheet. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which is yeah. kind of hilarious. Yeah. So uh funny not funny um kind of like i don't know if we i don't know if we ended up reaching out to him i think we just didn't have enough to like we had more than we needed i'm about to sneeze we had more than we needed and so we ended up um like not worrying about it we were just kind of like whatever we'll just (laughs) not mess with the the fight um but it also probably doesn't help that we did it under a prototype batch and so because it was such a low volume um, that it was cheaper to just order it as like a prototype. Um, How many did you sample? A hundred. OK, so I'm doing 10 times that. Yes. Yeah. But so one of the nice things about Kickstarter is you get you can get bulk pricing on other things that you use. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, I'm, I need 500 boxes for the Kickstarter, but I'm going to order a thousand boxes so that mm-hmm. I can get those price breaks for everything down the road Mm -hmm. and ordering a thousand is like a hundred bucks more than ordering 500. Exactly. Exactly. When you start ordering in volume and you get up to those higher numbers, it's like just order a few extra. It's not going to cost you that much more and it'll cost you so much more to go back and do it another order later that it's just worth it to keep it in inventory. Yeah. It would be almost double to split it out into two batches. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's exciting. So are you doing any, are you still going to do the laser cut inserts that you had? Yes, I will be. They are now a slightly different size. This one that I had designed doesn't really work. I had like 25 of these laser cuts, so not a big deal. I mean, I think that looks really cool. Personally. Yeah, I think it works well. Uh, The big difference is they will be able to fit. How do I describe this for audio listeners? Right now, they go diagonally across the box because that's the size of the box I could get. Mm -hmm. In the future, they won't have to go diagonally, which means I can fit more in there. Oh, okay. Uh, Also, this box, it's a three inch by three inch box, is smaller than all standard shipping labels. Mm -hmm. So I would have had to like wrap a shipping label around it. And I was told that that's a really good way to lose a lot of packages. So... Are you planning on sticking your smaller boxes inside a larger box, or are you planning on shipping them just as is? Nope. Just slap a label on it and send it off in the mail. Because we did a box inside a box when we did our yes. our, our stuff. Um, I mean, there's nothing be- wrong with doing that, but like the whole point of like the whole point of a custom packaging is that people get to see the custom packaging. Well, yes, but then you're slapping a label over the whole thing. Well, we're designing it with that in mind. Oh, okay. And the outside of the box really doesn't have too much going on. It's more about the inside of the box. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. I just didn't want you to, like... I, it sounded like you were designing all this stuff, and it's like, you're going to stick a label around half of it. So. <laughs> yeah. Go go watch the hour-long YouTube video with me and Scott Okay, talking about packaging. Yeah, I'll go look at that one. So, um, what else? Um, oh, we started to, there's some stuff that we've been working on in the back end that we finally started posting to Instagram. Um, kind of some like how it's made video type stuff where we, uh, uh-huh. where we're filming, um, the whole design process from start to finish on stuff where we're doing the engineering work. And then we're 3D printing prototypes and then we're machining it and then coming out to final product and showing it in use. Um, So we have two of those up right now. They're probably still a little bit longer format than um, some people do, but I think they look good. So we'll probably tweak those as time goes on. How long are they? Um, I mean, they're like a minute, but like for your fast paced, average person who like looks at reels on Instagram. Um, it's probably a little bit on the longer side. Cause you know, the, 
I was talking to, I have a friend who's uh, does a lot of YouTube and he was saying like, you need to be like cutting every three to five seconds. Yes. Um, between different shots. And sometimes we do that, but like when we get into some of it, like we'll hold it for, you know, seven or eight seconds, a shot. And that's probably a little bit too long. And you can definitely feel it when you get to those moments, it'll be like, jump, 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 pause, jump, 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 kind of a deal. It, it depends. The it's all about rhythm and like expectations. And if you go cut, 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 end of video, then the video becomes monotonous and like people still lose attention, even though because you're changing rapidly. But if you go cut, 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 long, cut, 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 long, cut, 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 long, long, yeah, then it it. Like you, you build up the expectation of the cut, and then when you don't give it to people, that makes them pay attention again. That's and that's that's valid. So make keep them guessing, kind of a deal. Yeah, it, it's all just about rhythm, and and you can do things like intentionally establishing like cut, 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 long, cut, 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 long, cut, 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 long, and then that's you can true. change it up, and that will also, true. yeah, it's, it's just rhythm, like yeah. it's just like music, you you make a rhythm and by keeping it or breaking it is how you make it interesting. Yeah. That's something that we'll definitely have to play with as time goes on. It's, you know, I'm, I'm not very good at the social media game. And so it's something that we're trying to learn a little bit, but we are starting to get more and more followers. So we're almost up to 700. So excited about that. So. It's definitely been growing a lot more since we've been posting a lot more regularly. So yes, that that is how that works. <laughs> that, that is how that works. Which, so mine has not been growing because I have not been posting regularly, except for Instagram stories and YouTube. But like yeah. my Instagram account has been pretty stagnant because I haven't been posting on it. So I have a random question for you. Okay. How well does your Etsy page do? Like, are you doing a lot of sales here recently? Right now, it has been doing very poorly mostly because i don't have very many things for sale okay and i'm not pushing it at all okay so when i had when i had eight or ten items on there in stock it was doing pretty well um Mm -hmm. you know like thousand dollars a month or so without too much effort now i have basically two things on there um well, I guess three things. I have the parametric pry bars, which those are a terrible product for Etsy because they're super complicated to explain to people. Mm-hmm. And then I have the orange slices, which those are my best seller. Right now I'm selling, you know, one or two, maybe, yeah, one or two a week or so. Mm-hmm. And then I have my powder coated trays, which are not selling at all. I haven't sold one of those forever. No, oh, okay. Uh, and that's like all I have on Etsy right now. Have you done enough Etsy? Like, do you, is it something where it's kind of like a Instagram or any of these other social media sites where if you feed the, if you feed the algorithm, you, you sell more over time? Oh, 100%. Yeah. It's all about the algorithm. Okay. Cause we're starting, like we're, we're just now, and I've kind of mentioned this a couple of times, but we're starting to pick up our pace and I'm just wanting to, I'm just curious as to how to keep it growing type of a deal. Yeah. Uh, now one thing, and don't let this, um, it's the season, I know. In January, yeah. January yeah. 1st, your sales go, ooh. Yeah. And just fall off a, a mountain. And that, mm-hmm. that's for everybody. But yeah, it's all about momentum. The more momentum you have, the more uh, impressions that Etsy will give you. And the more impressions that Etsy gives you, the more likely it is that you'll sell something. Yeah. 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 I, I know it's a feedback loop, and I've been trying to figure it out a little bit. So... Because it'd be nice to, uh, we're, we're almost to that point where we're doing a, a thousand a month on Etsy. And That's I'm awesome. hoping that, yeah. that it continues to grow and, and that we cross that threshold and keep pushing up. So, yeah. yeah. One of the keys on Etsy is don't run out of inventory. Because yeah. if you run out of inventory, then people can't buy your thing and then you lose all your momentum. Yeah, which is the other reason that I'm really upset about our laser going down because our most popular products all revolve around the laser and we have some items in stock, but not much because we were kind of making them as they went, as they came. Um, And so 
that might bite us in the butt, especially for anything customized, because we have a lot of customizable stuff on there. Um, and so hopefully we, we have another buddy who has a laser that we, we used when it first went down, um, but I don't want to rely on that for any long period of time. So. so how soon can you get replacement parts or a new laser? We're doing a laser exchange. So we packaged okay. it up and dropped it off today to get shipped out. And we're hoping that once they confirm that the package has been shipped, that they will ship one out um, as soon as as soon as they see the tracking number of it heading their way. So okay. um, worst case scenario would be they would wait till they physically receive it and make, and make sure they have everything. Um, which could take by the end, it took, could take a week or two. And then we have to wait for however long it takes for them to get it, a new one shipped out. So, so at this point, even just buying a new one, wouldn't really help you because it might be faster. Um, and we've talked about getting a smaller one. Um, so the one we have right now is like an 80 watt. And so we've talked about getting like a 20 or 30 watt one, which is like a third or a fourth, the price of the 80 just because for part marking, we could have two. We could have the, the, the bigger one doing the, the deep engrave, you know, run for a couple hours stuff. And we could have the other, the smaller one doing the quick part markings, you know, five, 10 minutes per part. And so we could kind of have two things going at the same time type deal. So, because it's, it's if, quickly, it's quickly becoming something that we do a lot of stuff with that laser. If you buy a smaller one and don't decide to keep it, I'll buy it from you. So, like, if you need to buy a smaller one and use it for a month or two, like, when if you're done, when you're done with it, I'll I'll buy it from you, unless okay. you decide to keep it. We might have to do that then. Yeah, I mean, we're probably gonna if we do get one, we'll probably keep it. Like, we'll buy it with the intention of keeping it. But that does um, that does help if we run into a situation where we, you know, we we need it for a little bit and then we get our next one up and running and then we need the cash. <laughs> so, cause I was going to buy one sometime next year anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would help. I'll, 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 I'll think about that and get back to you on that, 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 that could be very beneficial. Um, so yeah. So, um, in, in fact, um, one of the guys that reached out to me last week. So we started doing some utility knife uh, Damascus engravings. And we hadn't really sold a single one yet. Um, but I had a buddy who went to a knife show and ran into a guy who was selling um, custom utility knife blade holders. Like just the, the body of it. And he's he's been looking for someone to do Damascus laser engravings for a while. And... My buddy was like, hey, you should talk to him. He just started doing it. And so we he, he wanted to order like 50 right off the bat. And I was like, our laser's down. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that kind of hurt. <laughs> and so just but but hopefully we'll get it all up and running and we can start shipping more stuff out. Can you actually make money off of selling those, especially if you're selling them wholesale to somebody? Because you take oh. a 30 cent piece of material and you make it into a 60 cent piece of material. Like it depends on how you look at it. Um, Cause if you can set them up on a grid array and let it run and then flip them all over and let it run. Um, it's real easy. It's a real mindless job. It's like um, hit go work on something for a little while. If it stops and it's just sitting there, that's fine. Um, then that, when you notice it, just, run the next one and it's one of those things that um if we did enough of it i would build a dedicated machine that would like load them in front of the laser let it laser engrave move it off grab the next one and then it would be on like a conveyor belt almost where it just run automatically um and that's kind of what i want to do with tags if i can get enough tag work um and the razor blades kind of fall into that same category of it's something monotonous that if I can get enough work of it to justify putting a little time into some automation, I would do that in a heartbeat. And then it doesn't matter how much I sell them for, I'm still making money. Yeah. It just seems like you have to do a lot of them to be worth it. Like a lot. I mean, it depends on how you look at it. Cause you know, if, if, 
we're selling 10 for five. Um, and 10, then 10 blades for five dollars. Sorry, five for 10. It's okay. five blades for ten dollars, so two dollars a blade. Um, and set and well, we haven't really sold any yet. But that's probably because it's kind of a, an oddity for our, our store. So people aren't going to our store looking for razor blades. Um, but, you know, it's, I don't know, like 30, 40 cents a blade. Um, and then it's a minute or two per side. So call it four minutes of labor uh, plus 30 to 40 cents of labor of material um, for $2. A blade. I mean, it's not like I'm not going to go retire off of it, but for work that's just like, I don't have to think about it. I don't have to mess with it very much. It's just set up, let it run um, one at a time or a array at a time or automated um, makes a lot of sense. And you start doing that. So Fair plus enough. if we plus if we ever start, if we ever do make a knife or utility knife. Like if we start selling enough of these that we go, Oh, we should make a custom utility knife that may or may not happen at some point down the road. Um, then, um, then we'll already have all the infrastructure set up to do our own razor blades for it. And at that point, I think they would sell a lot better. Okay. That's fair. So it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, We're, we're making everything that we can think of making and putting it on Etsy and seeing what does well and what's worth our effort. Um, so this might be one of those things where it's like, yeah, you know, we've, we've done it for a few months. It doesn't really sell. There's not enough people out there and it's ends up taking up more time than we thought it would take up. So we can just drop it from our website, but you know, for the very low, low, low cost of being able to get into it, you know, you know, 30, $40 worth of razor blades, and then just start engraving them and then selling them. It's not a whole lot of investment for R and D R and D um, to the website. Okay. Fair enough. So, but yeah, there, I mean, it's kind of like one of those things where we're trying to build out our, you know, there's not going to be a single item on our website, on our Etsy page. That's going to pay for everything that we do. But if I can just, it's kind of like adding to that pile. If it fills out our website, it gives us, you know, an extra item or two that we can sell when people visit our page. Um, I think that helps. Yeah. Yeah, I was, I was kind of thinking about high, high mix, low volume sales of products the other day. Mm -hmm. Going, you know, how many, how many. Um, sales do you really or how many how would i phrase this like how many products would i need to have that are just kind of slowly selling themselves you know one a week how many how many products would i need if they were selling one a week would i need to pay my salary yeah and it's mm -hmm. i don't know it's not nothing but it's not impossible yeah so if you look at it, we're like, let's say every month for every, every item you have in your store sells, uh, you know, five times every month. So an average of once a week, or, you know, a little over once a week per item in your store. You know, how many items do you need in your store to pay your salary? And so our store, I don't know how many items we're up to, but it's quite a bit. We're, we're starting to get up there in variety of items, which is awesome. And let's see here, I'll just count it up real quick, but it's just one of those things. Um, we have 24 items listed. So, um, you know, everything we can add yeah, to that, at all. Um, everything, every item that we can add to that list will help. So. Yeah. I really need to invest some time in my Etsy store and just like getting, just getting products up there and listed. But right now, most of my bandwidth is going to just kind of like basically I can just do maintenance tasks plus the Kickstarter. Yeah. And, and see, that's where I, I I would like to see us work out well, where um, if, if you can keep focused on R&D and then have your Etsy page just 
keep it in stock, I think that would work well for you. Yeah, so. that's that's where I'm wanting to head. Yeah, get the product going, and then you just have to keep it in stock, and then you can keep working on your next ones and you build it up. So you're you're focusing more on doing kickstart launches of everything where we're focused on just getting product in the store and we'll, you know, there might be some stuff that we'll do some kickstarted with later, but we just don't have the, the energy to devote to that with all the other stuff we're trying to do. It's much easier to just get a product, stick it out there and see how it does. So. But Um, speaking of things that are incredibly high effort and low return, uh, I started a new (laughs) YouTube channel. Oh, really? Yeah. It is called Five Minute Fusion. Five Minute Fusion. I like that. That's a good name. Uh, 33 EDC on Instagram came up with that. I originally had it called like Design the Everything Learning. And he was like, Mm -hmm. Five Minute Fusion is catchy. And I was like, it is. And I I took that name and made it mine. I've, I've thought about making SolidWorks videos before because every single video that I see on SolidWorks is usually pretty junk and yes. or um in a different language or heavy heavily accented <laughs> it doesn't have the younger more hip user base that uh fusion does yeah yeah that is that is for sure so i've thought about doing those especially because i'm teaching a class now i've thought about if i could incorporate that into my like if i could pull double duty and make stuff for class and then post it online um type type deal so design the everything's in, uh initial social media presence started off as doing fusion tutorials and in fact like you know right now on youtube i have like 3700 uh subscribers mm-hmm. i had like 3500 when i was doing uh fusion tutorials mm-hmm. uh like six years ago yeah, and if yeah. I had stuck with that, I, I kind of regret not because I think it would have kept growing really fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, well, with how Fusion got popular over a short period of time, I mean that's yeah. that's the kind of the same time frame that uh, Saunders started like really blowing up, and he did a lot of stuff with Fusion. Still does, yeah. um, video tutorial wise. But I, I was in early, and I didn't really appreciate how like the. I didn't realize how fast it was growing. It was just like, oh, look, this is really easy. I'm just getting subscribers all of a sudden. And now that I'm yeah. doing uh, not Fusion and the growth is a lot more difficult, it's like, oh, yeah, those were the days. That was really nice. Yeah. Yeah. If I had kept that up, I could have been at like 100,000 by now. But mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the short stuff does really well, like the YouTube shorts. And I was just sitting here thinking uh, SolidWorks shorts – would be a pretty good <laughs> might have to do like a solid work shorts you could definitely try it i don't know how much of a, a market there is out there but i mean i guess if youtube's all about small niches so yeah well i i know that like i am always on the hunt for when i was especially when i was using solidworks daily i was always on the hunt for the next little trick or a thing you could do to speed you up just a little bit more um and I, I loved it whenever we would hire someone new who had been using SolidWorks longer than me. And then they would be like, oh, by the way, did you know you can do this? And I'm like, no, but I will <laughs> add that to my <laughs> to my book of tricks. So, yeah. but. So right now I have one video up there and I mean, it's got like 40 views. Yeah. Which is fine, but all, basically my plan is instead of doing Instead of doing tutorials that are like, let's 3D model a pair of scissors, I'm going to do like, this is the extrude button and this is everything the extrude button does. That was my first video. My next yeah. video will be like, this is the revolve button and this is everything the revolve button does. Mm-hmm. And just kind of work my way through all of the buttons. All- mm-hmm. Yeah, that's something that would be like, and if you can, the, the key will be if you can like, word it in such a way that people that are like using fusion they're like how do i get this extrude feature to do this and then they yep. go on youtube and it's like here's everything you need to know about this extrude button and especially if you can um uh put timestamps on everything um, it's the first time i've ever done that i think i think that'll be huge because people that want to like 
go to a certain section of that. And the, and the beautiful thing about doing that is doesn't, um, doesn't YouTube show you like the most popular parts of a video that are like the most watched sections? It does. Though the, the biggest thing about doing timestamps is when you're, when someone searches for something on Google, which is where a lot of my fusion traffic used to come from was straight from Google. Mm -hmm. The video, if your video has timestamps and someone runs across it on Google, it will show them all of the different timestamps and Mm -hmm. it'll take up like half of the screen as they're scrolling, Mm -hmm. which is just really valuable real estate. You get, you know, a lot more clicks when you have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not only that, but it makes it a lot easier to search because if they're searching for something in particular, doesn't it show you like the timestamp? Like if you had your thing is like the extrude and then you go in there and you go, uh, uh, you know, symmetrical extruding, and, and like you have like a time like a a, a timestamp for that, and they're searching for a symmetrical extrude, it'll pull to that straight to that part on that video. Yep that that's my theory. Yeah, it's all about this one. This channel is all about search optimization. Yeah, which is yeah my design the everything channel has zero of that. Yeah, <sighs> I got a cat. So. It's really needy right now. <laughs> But basically, my plan is to slowly build up that library, and because like right now, when I only have one video, it's not really useful. But when you mm-hmm. have all of the common tools in there, that's where it becomes, you know, a useful resource for someone. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Uh, and speaking of which, I actually saw some. I had a, a this is slightly into the weeds, so warning. But I had a buddy who was showing me, uh, who, who was sharing a TikTok video with me the other day. This guy had created, had used a, a Raspberry Pi and he stuck it inside like a Pelican case, like a small one with a screen and a keyboard. And he had it for outdoor hiking. Uh-huh. And it would transmit a local network. And he downloaded all of Wikipedia, okay. um, a ton of videos about how to deal with different problems that you would have in the wilderness. Basically, he made like a hub for everything that you would need if you're out in the wilderness and there is no internet and you can't search something. And so he would just carry it with him with it turned on transmitting as a hotspot, not connected to the actual internet, but kind of like a subnet to, um, you know, for people that if they needed to find something fast. So that's it. I was like, that's that's a really cool idea. So. But I was thinking about that in relation to what you're doing for Fusion. You're basically creating that that database for people. So, And do you know what's funny? So I have all of my old Fusion tutorials uh, unlisted on my channel just mm-hmm. because I don't want to confuse YouTube about you know what the Design the Everything main channel is. Mm-hmm. I can tell that there are people using my videos in classes. Oh, really? Yes, because every now and then one of the videos will get like 35 views within like an hour. And <laughs> you can see the traffic refer information and it's always like uh, Blackboard or like there's there's just one that's called like Schooly or something like that. That's hilarious. And so it's this video that's six years old, unlisted, and, and somehow it's getting used on in, in some kind of class. Yeah, that's funny. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I would love to, speaking of unlisted videos, I would love to see all of the unlisted videos for Jay Pearson because that's how he runs his business. Oh, yes. Unlisted videos and, and like barcodes everywhere so people can just go through. I would love to see how he does that. So You just have to like watch through his videos and like screenshot every time a QR code shows up. Yeah, pretty much. Because... <laughs> I think it I think that's such a cool idea that I just don't have the time or reason to do it yet. So um but it's a very cool idea that I think would benefit yourself especially if like you know if if the business grows to a point to where you know you have a whole bunch of machines and you're jumping around and trying to figure out well how did I used to do XYZ. Yeah. So on the the packaging that Scott and I are working on, one of the things that we we just put on there is we have three different QR codes that'll lead to three different videos. 
Oh, really? And yeah, there's going to be like you, you're going to open the the package, and mm-hmm. on that lid that's right in front of you, we're going to have one QR code, and mm-hmm. that's going to go to like a welcome video that's like, "Hey, I'm AJ. Thanks for buying this." Yada yada yada. Mm-hmm. Then under the label, we are going to have a QR code. I don't know what it's going to go to yet. It may just be like a Rickroll, but it's mm-hmm. going to be it's some little Easter egg. And then on the the bottom, underneath all of the packaging, because mm-hmm. uh, we have these little inserts that you can remove, we are going to have one that has like, basically it's going to say, hey, this is all compostable and recyclable. Uh, gotcha. And just information on like the sustainability side of the packaging. Hmm. That'll be fun. So I just just little Easter eggs, like it just makes yeah, it just makes products mm-hmm. more fun. Yeah, yeah, make it a memorable experience type yep. deal. Mm-hmm. And ninety nine percent of people won't scan them, but one percent will love them. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah, and that's <clears throat> th- those are your super fans. Those are the ones that are gonna the ones that that do appreciate it. They're gonna tell everyone about it. So. Exactly. They're the um, the sneezers, as, as Seth Godin calls them. Yeah. Now, what you need to do, here's a thought for you. For the sticker that goes on the inside, or for the, the QR code you're sticking on the inside, and this is, I don't, I don't know if this is possible. I, I really don't. But I, I think it would be awesome if it was. If you could have it where you would have a QR code that had a different URL for every person that you did it for. Ooh. And you'd have the same, the same video, but this would be just kind of funny. And I, some people might take it the wrong way. I don't know, but I think it would be kind of cool where like you said, hi, this is AJ. Thank you. And then like in a computer voice or like text yeah. across the bottom, like the actual person's name <laughs> or something. Um, so you're not making a bunch of videos, but like depending on which code you 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 have, it'll put the person's name on the bottom. I that, think that would be that would be cool. I or or like in the top corner, like I could be like even if like your video is something, but you have their name show up in the corner of the video somehow, or like as the title, like thank you so and so, and then the video. I mean, if I could, I would record a personalized video for everyone who bought something like if that was possible <laughs> i would um i when someone when someone buys something from me and i know who they are on instagram i always send them a video mm-hmm. the problem is that's like half the time i i don't connect username to name and mm-hmm. half the time they're not from instagram anyway yeah but yeah, wh- yeah. whenever i can i send them a personalized video it's like hey thanks yeah. i appreciate this and generally, it's of me putting it in my mailbox. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if I could record every single person a video, I would. Yeah, but, but it would just be cool. That would be a nightmare, though. Yes. But it'd be cool if you could, like, tie that into the, the QR code somehow. Yeah. I mean, you could just print You could just print a QR code on the label printer and slap it on there. True. Um, speaking of which... If you're having these boxes made, have you already made the links for all of these or? No. So the way they're going to work is it's going to go to a, like they, they are going to URLs on my website, but those are just going to get redirected to YouTube videos. Gotcha. So I know what the, I know what the URLs are, but gotcha. they don't go to anywhere yet. Gotcha. So they're just blank URLs. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Hmm. Hmm. So I have a topic that I think we should talk about next week. Oh, what's that? Or later. You can tell me this is jumping the gun. Uh, But one of the things I did today was go over my 2023 goals and like Mm -hmm. what I want to accomplish in 2023. I don't know if you have those ready yet, but either next week or at some point in the future, we should talk about those. I have not prepared anything of the sort. Um, that's why I didn't. I, I was going to talk about those today, and then I realized that would be mean because I am prepared and you are not. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, I don't think I've really done that for this business, um, just because I'm still in the process of figuring out everything about what we're doing with this business. We're we're so malleable right now that it's it's kind of hard to come up with concrete goals. 
if that makes sense. Um, have you considered that you're malleable, which is why you need concrete goals right now? Yes. Yes. It's just I'm – I don't know what the personality type you is. You will but stay that's, malleable until you have concrete goals. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That's valid. But hmm. this, this is what I made today. I'm going to show my the video watchers here. Uh, it might be mirror image for you. So I, I basically, I used my laser to cut out and engrave these little like placards mm -hmm. and I put my goals on there. So this one says like Kickstarter number one funded and I'm planning on doing four Kickstarters next year. So I have Kickstarters one through four. Uh, I have one for first Amazon sale. I have one for a hundred K in revenue and there's half a dozen more on the, on the wall there. That's awesome. So it, when I accomplish my goal, this is my, my plan. I can take it off the wall. And then break it and like throw it or something, just as a little celebration. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I like that idea a lot. I really do. Yeah, we'll have to think about that because I'll have to sit down with my uh, my cousin and come up with some goals. Because that having goals does make it you know, a lot easier to strive towards something because you know, because you, you're trying to achieve something. So. Yeah. And I mean, if you don't have goals, then you're just always in survival mode. That's true. Which is where I am right now. Like I'm in survival mode, absolutely, with the, the Kickstarter. But like, I'm never going to grow if I don't get out of survival mode. Yeah, that's valid. It's, it's, it's one of those things where you... um you got to spend some time looking towards the future. That way you can see how to get yourself out of where you're currently at. So, yeah, that's something I haven't done in a while that probably needs to be done. So this is going to force me to come up with some goals. So I like yeah, it. Next week, I gave you homework. <sighs> and here I thought I was done with homework. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you went man. back to school. Granted, on the other side of the desk, but... Yes, yeah. And do you give homework? N I haven't, really, no. Oh, you're, you're we do most friend. of the stuff in class. Um, and, like, I am very disjointed with my class, honestly. Um, but it's going well, and they're enjoying it, and it's kind of a lower-stress environment for them. So in that sense... Um, they absolutely love it. And I feel like the ones that know how to take advantage of it are learning a ton. And like they they rave about the class. Um, there's a few other that complain that it's not as structured as some of their other ones. Um, and my kind of fallback is so's life. Life isn't really <laughs> structured. And um, when they go into whatever engineering job that they're going into odds are is they're going to get thrown into a deep end for a little while and they're going to figure out how to swim. So that's some of my justification. Like I do need to do a little bit better about, um, about giving them a little more structure, but at the same time um, it's interesting to see some of the solutions they come up to problems because there's different solutions that I haven't thought of to kind of problems that I pose to them. And so I'm learning from them just as much as they are learning from me in some of these instances. And I think that value kind of goes out the window as soon as you tell them, okay, here's the part, here's exactly how you're going to design it versus letting them go off into the weeds and go, okay, that might not have been the best thing to do, but you had a really interesting thought in this area that I really like, but you know, some of this other stuff, you don't need to go that far type yeah. thing. So just tell them it's the Socratic method. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very true. So but I've had some really good talks and I think they appreciate the fact that I'm not a institutional teacher in the sense that um, I bring a lot of like real world examples of problems that I'm dealing with sometimes on a daily basis um, to, to, to their attention. It's like, this is the real world. Like I'm, I have a foot in both right now. So, <laughs> but I enjoy it. And I think, a lot of these kids are going to do really well and I'm, I'm looking forward to see how they progress. Yeah. That's awesome. And maybe you get so, a higher one someday. 
I would love to. I would love to. There's a there's a couple that I would be very happy to bring on as an intern or to hire full time if I had the, the money to afford it. Um, because there's some there is some really smart kids in there. So, well, I think I'm done. Yeah, I don't I don't really have anything else. Um, just uh, it's I'm. In that stage where I'm, I'm both excited for the future and like the, the long term future is bright, the short term future is going to be a little crazy. Yeah, that <laughs> sounds about right. <laughs> Especially so, the holidays coming up. Yeah, yeah. it's going to be hard. Um, my my cousin's going away for um, next week for I think half the week, so that's going to be fun. Yeah, my goal is to get all the carabiner shipped before Christmas, so we'll see if that happens. Yep. So, all right. Well, I guess I'll take us out. Yeah, please. Uh, so for those of you who have held on for our little talk this week, we appreciate it. Um, this is Harrison with Precision Ingenuity signing out with AJ from the Design the Everything. Have a good, have a good evening. Subscribe and tell your friends. <laughs> Re- leave reviews. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye.